The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill Read by Adrian Pretzelis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Big Bow Mystery by Israel Zangwill Chapter 11 So, you were right, Denzil could not help saying as he greeted Grodman a week afterwards. I shall not live to tell the story of how you discovered the bow murderer. Sit down, growled Grodman. Perhaps you will after all. There was a dangerous gleam in his eyes. Denzil was sorry he had spoken. I sent for you, Grodman said, to tell you that on the night Wimp arrested Mortlake, I had made preparations for your arrest. Denzil gasped. What for? My dear Denzil, there is a little law in this country invented for the confusion of the poetic. The greatest exponent of the beautiful is only allowed the same number of wives as the greengrocer. I do not blame you for not being satisfied with Jane. She is a good servant, but a bad mistress. But it was cruel to Kitty not to inform her that Jane had a prior right to you, and unjust to Jane not to let her know of the contract with Kitty. They both know it now well enough, curse them, said the poet. Yes, your secrets are like your situations. You can't keep them long. My poor poet, I pity you betwixt the devil and the deep sea. There are a pair of harpies, each holding over me the Damocles sword of an arrest for bigamy. Neither loves me. I should think they would come in very useful to you. You plant one in my house to tell my secrets to Wimp, and you plant one in Wimp's house to tell Wimp's secrets to me, I suppose. Out with some, then. Upon my honour, you wrong me. Jane brought me here, not I, Jane. As for Kitty, I never had such a shock in my life as finding her installed in Wimp's house. She thought it safer to have the law handy for your arrest. Besides, she probably desired to occupy a parallel position to Jane's. She must do something for a living. You wouldn't do anything for hers. And so you couldn't go anywhere without meeting a wife. Ha, ha, ha! Serve you right, my polygamous poet. But why should you arrest me? Revenge, Denzil. I've been the best friend you ever had in this cold, prosaic world. You've eaten my bread, drunk my claret, written my book, smoked my cigars and pocketed my money. And yet... When you have an important piece of information bearing on a mystery about which I am thinking day and night, you calmly go and sell it to Wimp. I d didn't, stammered Denzel. Liar! Do you think that Kitty has any secrets from me? As soon as I discovered your two marriages, I determined to have you arrested for your treachery. But when I found you had, as I thought, put Wimp on the wrong scent, when I felt sure that by arresting Mortlake he was going to make a greater ass of himself than even nature had been able to do, then I forgave you. I let you walk about the earth and drink freely. Now it is Wimp who crows. Everybody pats him on the back. They call him the mystery man of the Scotland Yard tribe. Poor Tom Mortlake will be hanged, and all through your telling wimp about Jesse Diamond. It was you yourself, said Denzil sullenly. Everybody was giving it up, and you said, let us find all that Arthur Constant did in the last few months of his life. Wimp couldn't miss stumbling on Jesse sooner or later. I'd have throttled Constant if I'd known he touched her, he wound up with irrelevant indignation. 
Grodman winced at the idea that he himself had worked ad majorum glorium of Wimp. And yet had not Mrs. Wimp let out as much at the Christmas party? "'What's past is past,' he said gruffly. "'But if Tom Mortlake hangs, you go to Portland.' "'How can I help Tom hanging?' "'Help the agitation as much as you can. "'Write letters under all sorts of names to all the papers. "'Get everybody you know to sign the great petition. "'Find out where Jessie Diamond is, "'the girl who holds the proof of Mortlake's innocence.' "'You really believe him innocent?' "'Don't be satirical, Denzil. "'Haven't I taken the chair at all the meetings? "'Am I not the most copious correspondent of the press?' "'I thought it was only to spite Wimp.' "'Rubbish! It's all to say poor Tom. "'He no more murdered Arthur Constant than you did.' "'He laughed an unpleasant laugh. "'Denzil bade him farewell, frigid with fear.' Grodman was up to his ears in letters and telegrams. Somehow he had become the leader of the rescue party. Suggestions, subscriptions came from all sides. The suggestions were burned. The subscriptions acknowledged in the papers and used for hunting up the missing girl. Lucy Brent headed the list with a hundred pounds. It was a fine testimony to her faith in her dead lover's honour. The release of the jury had unloosed the greater jury, which always now sits upon the smaller. Every means was taken to nullify the value of the palladium of British liberty. The foreman and the jurors were interviewed. The judge was judged, and by those who were no judges. The Home Secretary, who had done nothing beyond accepting office under the Crown, was vituperated, and sundry provincial persons wrote confidentially to the Queen. Arthur Constance backsliding cheered many by convincing them that others were as bad as themselves, and well-to-do tradesmen saw in Mortlake's wickedness the pernicious effects of socialism. A dozen new theories were afloat. Constant had committed suicide by esoteric Buddhism, as witness his devotion to Madame Bavlatsky, or he had been murdered by his Mahatma, or victimized by hypnotism, mesmerism, sonambulism, and other weird abstractions. Grodman's great point was, Jesse Diamond must be produced, dead or alive. The electric current scoured the civilized world in search of her. What wonder if the shrewder sort divined that the indomitable detective had fixed his last hope on the girl's guilt. If Jessie had wrongs, why should she not have avenged them herself? Did she not always remind the poet of Joan of Arc? Another week passed. The shadow of the gallows crept over the days, on, on, remorselessly drawing nearer, as the last ray of hope sunk below the horizon. The Home Secretary remained inflexible. The great petitions discharged their signatures at him in vain. He was a conservative, sternly conscientious, and the mere insinuation that his obstinacy was due to the politics of the condemned only hardened him against the temptation of a cheap reputation for magnanimity. He would not even grant a respite to increase the chances of the discovery of Jesse Diamond. In the last of the three weeks, there was a final monster meeting of protest. Grodman again took the chair, and several distinguished faddists were present, as well as numerous respectable members of society. The Home Secretary acknowledged the receipt of their resolutions. The trade unions were divided in their allegiance. Some whispered of faith and hope, others of financial defalcations. The former essayed to organize a procession and an indignation meeting on the Sunday preceding the Tuesday fixed for the execution, but it fell through on a rumor of confession. The Monday papers contained a last masterly letter from Grodman exposing the weakness of the evidence, but they knew nothing of a confession. The prisoner was mute and disdainful. 
professing little regard for a life empty of love and burdened with self-reproach. He refused to see a clergyman. He was accorded an interview with Miss Brent in the presence of a jailer and solemnly aspirated his respect for her dead lover's memory. Monday buzzed with rumours. The evening papers chronicled them hour by hour. A poignant anxiety was abroad. The girl would be found. Some miracle would happen. A reprieve would arrive. The sentence would be commuted. But the short day darkened into night, even as Mortlake's short day was darkening, and the shadow of the gallows crept on and on, and seemed to mingle with the twilight. Crowl stood at the door of his shop, unable to work. His big grey eyes were heavy with unshed tears. The dingy wintry road seemed one vast cemetery. The street lamps twinkled like corpse lights. The confused sounds of the street life reached his ear as from another world. He did not see the people who flitted to and fro amid the gathering shadows of the cold dreary night. One ghastly vision flashed and faded and flashed upon the background of the duskiness. Denzil stood beside him, smoking in silence. A cold fear was at his heart. That terrible Grodman! As the hangman's cord was tightening round Mortlake, he felt the convict's change tightening round himself. And yet there was one gleam of hope feeble as the yellow flicker of the gas lamp across the way. Grodman had obtained an interview with the condemned late that afternoon, and the parting had been painful, but the evening paper that in its turn had obtained an interview with the ex-detective announced on its placard, Grodman still confident, and the thousands who yet pinned their faith on this extraordinary man refused to extinguish the last sparks of hope. Denzil had bought the paper and scanned it eagerly, but there was nothing save the vague assurance that the indefatigable Grodman was still almost pathetically expectant of the miracle. Denzil did not share the expectation. He meditated flight. Peter, he said at last, I'm afraid it's all over. Crowl nodded, heartbroken. All over, he repeated, and to think that he dies, and it is all over. He looked despairingly at the blank winter sky, where leaden clouds shut out the stars. Poor young fellow, tonight alive and thinking, tomorrow night a clod, with no more sense or motion than a bit of leather. No compensation nowhere for being cut off innocent in the pride of youth and strength. A man who has always preached the useful, day and night, and toiled and suffered for his fellows. Where's the justice of it? Where's the justice of it? He demanded fiercely. Again his wet eyes wandered upwards towards heaven, that heaven away from which the dear soul of a dead saint at the Antipodes was speeding into infinite space. Well, where was the justice for Arthur Constant, if he too was innocent? said Denzil. Really, Peter, I don't see why you should take it for granted that Tom is so dreadfully injured. Your horny-handed labour leaders are, after all, men of no aesthetic refinement, with no sense of the beautiful. You cannot expect them to be exempt from the coarser forms of crime. Humanity must look to far other leaders, to the seers and the poets. Kentercott, if you say Tom's guilty, I'll knock you down. The little cobbler turned upon his tall friend like a roused lion. Then he added, I beg your pardon, Kentercott. I don't mean that. After all, I've got no grounds. The judge is an honest man, and with gifts I can't lay claim to. But I believe in Tom with all my heart, and if Tom is guilty, I believe in the cause of the people with all my heart all the same. The fads are doomed to death. They may be reprieved, but they must die at last. He drew a deep sigh and looked along the dreary road. 
It was quite dark now, but the light of the lamps and the gas in the shop windows, the dull, monotonous road, revealed all its sordid, familiar outlines. With its long stretches of chill pavement, its unlovely architecture, and its endless stream of prosaic pedestrians. A sudden consciousness of the futility of his existence pierced the little cobbler like an icy wind. He saw his own life, and a hundred million lives like his, swelling and breaking like bubbles on a dark ocean, unheeded, uncared for. A newsboy passed along, clabbering, "'The bow murderer! Preparations for his execution!' A terrible shudder shook the cobbler's frame. His eyes ranged sightlessly after the boy. The merciful tears filled them at last. "'The cause of the people,' he murmured brokenly. "'I believe in the cause of the people. There is nothing else.' "'Peter, come in to tea. You'll catch cold,' said Mrs. Crowl. Denzil went in to tea, and Peter followed. Meanwhile, round the house of the Home Secretary, who was in town, an ever-augmenting crowd was gathered, eager to catch the first whisper of a reprieve. The house was guarded by a cordon of police, but there was no inconsiderable danger of popular riot. At times a section of the crowd groaned and hooted. Once a volley of stones was discharged at the windows. The newsboys were busy vending their special editions, and the reporters struggled through the crowd, clutching descriptive pencils, and ready to push off to telegraph offices should anything extra special occur. Telegraph boys were coming up every now and again with threats messages, petitions, and exhortations from all parts of the country to the unfortunate Home Secretary, who was striving to keep his aching head cool as he went through the voluminous evidence for the last time and pondered over the more important letters which the greater jury had contributed to the obscuration of the problem. Grodman's letter in that morning's paper shook him most. Under his scientific analysis, the circumstantial chain seemed forged of painted cardboard. Then the poor man read the judge's summing up, and the chain became tempered steel. The noise of the crowd outside broke upon his ear in his study like the roar of a distant ocean. The more the rabble hooted him, the more he essayed to hold scrupulously the scales of life and death and the crowd grew and grew as men came away from their work. There were many that loved the man who lay in the jaws of death, and a spirit of mad revolt surged in their breasts. And the sky was grey, and the bleak night deepened, and the shadow of the gallows crept on. Suddenly a strange, inarticulate murmur spread through the crowd, a vague whisper of no one knew what. Something had happened. Somebody was coming. A second later, and one of the outskirts of the throng was agitated, and a convulsive cheer went up from it, and was taken up infectiously all along the street. The crowd parted. A hansom dashed through the centre. "'Grodman! Grodman!' shouted those who recognised the occupant. "'Grodman! Hurrah!' Grodman was outwardly calm and pale but his eyes glittered. He waved his hand encouragingly as the hansom dashed up to the door, cleaving the turbulent crowd as a canoe cleaves the waters. Grodman sprang out. The constables at the portal made way for him respectfully. He knocked imperatively. The door was opened cautiously. A boy rushed up and delivered a telegram. Grodman forced his way in, gave his name, and insisted on seeing the Home Secretary on a matter of life and death. Those near the door heard his words and cheered, and the crowd divined the good omen, and the air throbbed with cannonades of joyous sound. The cheers rang in Grodman's ears as the door slammed behind him. The reporters struggled to the front. An excited knot of working men pressed round the arrested hansom. They took the horse out. 
A dozen enthusiasts struggled for the honour of placing themselves between the shafts, and the crowd awaited Grodman. End of chapter 11